Hi everybody, it's Mark here at Tessery and Tessa closed green today and we can all be thankful for that considering how bad it was in the morning. But the closing price was $251.60, which was a $1.38 increase in share price from last week or 0.55% higher. So what did we see this morning? When the numbers came out for what? The production delivery numbers, guys. We've been talking about that for a couple of days and it was very brutal. I mean, pre-market, you saw 239 during regular cash hours. We saw a low of around $242 a share. But if you bought there, it rallied almost, what, 4.8% before it sold off a little bit and kind of ended, you know, not at the high of the day, but a decent green close. That's all we can really ask for. Now, um, what what happened exactly? Let's just look at the numbers real quick. And if you haven't gone over this with, uh, you know, other YouTubers or Twitch people, we'll just do it really quickly because I think a lot of people understand what happened. So firstly, you're seeing the production delivery numbers. We know that the Wall Street consensus, if you watch the videos from yesterday, was around 455,000 cars. So we we kind of missed by 19,000. And so you think would sell off tremendously. And I guess we did. I mean, the drawdown was back to $239 in the pre-market. Um, so why did this happen? Before we look at the charts and look at the price action and kind of understand what might happen from here on out, understand that there was multiple factors, like they mentioned, that were shut down for upgrades and, of course, new models. Um, that's the Model 3 Plus in China. The Model Y was revised. If you watched my video from yesterday, the Model Y in China was also revised. There was a, um, a shutdown of Model Y factory lines in Giga, Texas, along with the kind of, we don't know if it really shut down, but there was an ongoing upgrades to the Cybertruck line as well. So all those things kind of prevented more cars from being produced, and it kind of kept Model 3s um, from being sold in any decent number. There wasn't really Model 3s to be had um, across the globe, right? So we know if you try to buy one now, you're talking months out. Um, so there wasn't a lot of inventory for the Model 3s to sustain a decent number. Also, we also don't know how many cars are in transit. We do know that um, a lot of Model 3 Pluses are on the way to Europe. So we could see tens of thousands of cars being reflected um, in deliveries for quarter four right off the bat in these next couple of weeks. And uh, cross your fingers, you get a Cybertruck um, release as well. It is now quarter four. We don't have any news about when that's going to happen. Before we go back to the chart, we'll look at some economic data that came out this morning that was better than what people thought when it came to the PMI and ISM manufacturing. So uh, a little bit better, 1%. I mean, you, you want to see growth. You want to see over 50% on these numbers is what it is. I mean... We never know how the market's going to react to this kind of stuff, but seeing manufacturing bounce back a little bit is good because we've been seeing some really on, on a local basis where the Fed is tracking over in Pennsylvania, over in Dallas. It is the manufacturing. These factories are suffering really badly. And if you read the survey responses to these Fed, um, these uh, Fed uh, manufacturing reports, they are it's sad. Like, it's really sad. We listen to these business owners just they they really don't believe what the Fed is doing is right. And I can't say they're right or wrong. Who knows? I'm not an economist. But these rates are killing people. And what are the rates doing to, to equities? They're, they're, they're making them fight against what? These bond yields that are just out of control. Let's go over back to the chart. Let's understand what's happening on a macroeconomic level really quick. We'll look at yields first. And we've been looking at the long bond for a while, the 30-year. And we've been looking at this lower arrow. And now it is actually during the course of the day, peaked above our little, what we considered the, the the point that it would reject for the first time. Now, there was a slight rejection last week. It only lasted like a day, or it was like a 1% move down and had a big move up again today, um, sometimes around 1.6% on the 10-year yield, on 30-year yield. So this is, a, this is a peak that we thought that would play out as a resistance, peaks that we're seeing back in 2008 to 2010, a long time ago, great financial crisis, essentially. Uh, so if you don't find the 30 year resist here and start moving down and which would lead, of course, to a rally of equities, then you see a move up of 10 percent to the next level during the course of um, in the midst of the great financial crisis. And right before where yields were at 5.3 percent, that's a 10 and a half percent move up in yield on the long bond from now, from today. And we have the likes of Bill Ackman and a bunch of CNBC contributors talking about 5.5% on the long bond. Then they're shorting long bonds actively and they're telling everyone in the world, they're forecasting that you're going to see a 5.5% 30, 20 year type of situation 
what does that look like? What does a 5%, 5.5% look like? That's a 14, almost 15% move down on the TLT. If you were to hold TLT now and lose 15% after losing like 50% from the highs of 2021, I can't imagine. You, 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 your portfolio manager, I'm sorry, your fund manager, your money manager, financial advisor is telling you a 60-40 portfolio is safe. Now it is proven completely untrue that bond people, bond traders don't know what they're talking about. They have no idea. They had an easy life for years and now it's difficult. With bond volatility being higher than equity volatility, they don't know what's going on. But if you see a continued drawdown in the value of bonds, meaning that the yields go up, it's going to hurt equities a lot. We've been seeing it hurt equities ever since it's been moving up. And it can continue to do so until you see a bottoming process in the next couple of weeks, meaning a topping process on bonds that would take the long bonds into that 5.5% area. What about the 10-year? Looking at the 10-year, it is just relentless. I mean, relentless. If we were to look at a long duration, I mean, long time frame, we really want to see... <laughs> I mean, like, where does it stop? 5.2%? Like, if you were to take, if you were to get the, the, the 10 year to kind of top out during the 2006 and 2007 highs, that's like another 12% on the yield. 12%? Oh my gosh. What does that look like on the SP 500? I don't know what that looks like. It looks bad, like 400 on the SP 500. Let's look at the SP 500. How is the SP 500 doing? Now, so SP 500 had a decent, close just like tesla did but still close red and it's it had a nice kind of there's the action pre-market was good on sp500 until that sharp sell-off um, right before the open but if you see if this is in the bottom and typically the s p 500 doesn't bottom in september so this low that we saw in september 27th that might not be the low that we see for the rest of the year what could the low look like maybe another couple percentage points down if you start seeing a lot of red days coming this week like if I was to say this is just like your typical like kind of flagging pattern that fails, maybe you get down to the 420 area. Maybe you get even lower than that in the, in the longer term time frame towards the middle end of October. From here where it is now, you're talking about a drawdown of maybe one and a half percent. And that's not, it doesn't sound like a lot, right? It doesn't sound like a lot, but you really don't want to get into these lows of the spring. I would, that would be really bad for the S&P right? because it took so long to get to this point and to get to the point where you're making another notable low. That's very unhealthy for stocks. You know, where do you end up? Where do you end up? Do you go down to the 390 area like the, like JP Morgan thinks we, we could? Possibly. I mean, what does that look like from percentage terms? 395, let's say. It's only 7%, right? We've already dropped six some, from the highs in, in July. We've dropped um, from to the September low, 8% and the current, current close, 7%. So it's really just doubling of that loss. Um, from a long, long perspective, I would say a notable low will be made around that point if you're into those, you know, 390s area. But really, you can stay above 381 and still be bullish, not making a real lower low, quote unquote. Um, so there is some there is some flexibility in there to, to drop you know, the value of stocks a good amount and still be bullish going to the end of the year. Um, so I would like I always say all the time, we're always hedged, we're always selling calls. And if you've been selling calls for the last three months, you'd be okay. You know, three months, you say, what does three months look like? Well, let's just look at a different chart. The chart I made for um, the video I made yesterday. We've been consolidating. If I was go to present time, we've been consolidating for a very long time. I started making videos around when we, so we gapped up at the end of May into June. So if you're looking at this area right here where we gapped up, uh, on this end of this like bullish run, it's been 115 days, guys. It's been almost three months. I've gone in nowhere. So people that are scared to sell calls, if you're selling expensive calls for date, if you sold calls here that were dated two months out, man, you would have been great. You'd been fine. You would have made a lot of money because Tesla moves in these really terrible consolidations. Now, of course, do you remember last year when we thought this consolidation was a long time. And I, I remember talking to people. We thought this was this 54 day consolidation was a long time. We thought the spring of this year was a long time, maybe 84 days. Now we're almost a month over that going nowhere, going nowhere fast. But if you know that if you've been holding Tesla stock for a long time, like we've been going nowhere fast really for a long for for years, 2021, January, we're almost three years now. 
that were at the same price as it was three years and nine months ago. Nowhere, guys. Nowhere. And if you remember the look at this flatness for years where Tesla was not profitable and, you know, all the people were holding for a very long time with sometimes some real, this looks very flat compared to what it is now, but some of these drawdowns are very, very spectacular drawdowns. And that is, so that doesn't mean we can't go through that same thing again at all, right? I think being hedged is really, really important. Even just throwing a couple of bucks sometimes at a hedge can, can really save your butt if you're really heavily invested in the stock. It's so hard to get into a mindset though, I guess. You know, I, talk, I talk to a lot of hyper bullish people where then they really don't see what what's happening in the world um, when it comes to just the economic factors, even outside of Tesla's fundamentals. If looking at what's the economy like and what you know pricing pressure people are facing just trying to live on a daily basis, going to the grocery store, filling up their gas tank, what have you. It's tough out there for most people. Um, and you know Tesla is feeling that with, you know, lower than expected growth, um, sorry, lower than expected profit margins. And uh, though the growth is still there, right? So what we can hope for is a uh, quarter four can be kind of this cascade of, of great news when it comes to release of new products, products making it to new regions and uh, expansion of margins maybe, but also just, you know, having um, a glut of sales just being dumped into the beginning of this quarter could make the delivery numbers look great for quarter four, but that's still three months away. And we know three months um, can basically just grind you out. Uh, it's been three months since we gapped up in June and we're back to the same price three months later. So I would say uh, when looking at price action, like we would talk about, you know, we'd like to try to predict where price action goes. And we would kind of say that 255 has been a very tough resistance um, to, to beat just because of its for one, one reason alone, guys, it's just a $5 increment on Tesla share price. And $5 increments are really important when it comes to max pain points. It, when, when it comes to volume of options, they like they always congregate on those $5 increments. And um, we didn't we didn't get to 255 so it's not surprising that we sold off from it um, before reaching there. And where does it go tomorrow? You know, you could say that, and we talk about it all the time, when events happen on a Monday, you know, it's really hard to be positioned for that move because you have to hold over a weekend if you're playing with options. And maybe the market was basically pretty neutral on Tesla going into this. And so it would make sense that they kind of buoy support the stock price and drive it up a little bit more so they can get pre they can get positioned um, to send the stock lower if the market wants to go lower. Right. It's almost a great hedge. Like if you think S&P 500 is going to go lower, Tesla will probably go lower much faster at certain times. Right. At certain times. Um, and we know that as the s p goes into the beginning part of um, October, it's going to be a little bit stronger than what we've seen on seasonality charts when it comes to Tesla, where Tesla is kind of flat and start making, starts and it makes a new um, low in November sometimes. Um, I don't know what the catalyst would be for that because we've had a lot of negative catalysts already, especially with the economy. And uh, so we can we can really be thankful that Tesla stock is trying to stay above water. Um, but you don't know if this is just a setup uh, because they were not positioned for a move lower in Tesla and they wanna get positioned. So they hold a bunch of shares that they bought today. They can dump it tomorrow and they're already positioned in their puts and they can make a lot of money. I hope that's not the case, but it's possible. It's, it's, it's very possible because how do you explain to someone that Tesla misses and then what? The stock price goes up. But if you watched my videos yesterday, you would actually maybe believe that would be the case because what? Every time there's a move down from uh, a delivery number, it always reverses within one day and, and same thing vice versa. If stock price goes up really quickly on a production number, it usually sells off within a day. And you can watch that video, try to get a little bit more comfortable um, with that idea. Uh, and it played out today just a little bit faster than what, what we assumed, which was, you know, sell off in the morning and completely reverse um, in the, within the course of the day. Now that has actually happened before. If we were to look at, let's see if we can find where that might've happened before. Um, Let's see, or actually right here. Yeah, so in quarter two, 2022, you have a gap down. This is the gap down from the delivery. And then it, during the course of the day, this is the hourly chart, during the course of the day, it got bought back up to be kind of flat. So this is, this. it's happened before where it's it gaps down from a really tough sell in the morning and it recovers. 
And this is a very prime example of that. What happened the next couple of days? Over the next three or four days, it remained very, very bullish um, into, ironically, the same price we are at now. And this was in quarter two, 2022, over a year and a half ago. Okay, so let's look at S&P 500 again. I just want to look at the indicators to see if we are looking a little bit oversold. Oh, yeah. I mean, the RSI on S&P 500 is still desperately low in the mid, in the low 30s, something that you probably what haven't seen since um, September last year still. So still below March's RSI of this year. It's looking very, very bad um, for the S&P 500. And, but it is at the same kind of RSI levels where you found support eventually. It took a couple of days last year. It wasn't a quick, even though it, the RSI bottomed out, the equity price equities didn't bottom out. They still went a little bit lower, considerably lower actually, um, until um, they found a bottom, right? That that RSI reading in October was not the same RSI reading that was in September. So here's that really sharp low in, in October. And this is where the RSI bottomed over here in September, right? So it can go up a little bit like it did already. You know, it can drop down sharply find that kind of um, that base there and you have a sharp spring upwards or it could look like a con consolidation. We're not going to know what it's going to look like, but this might not be it when it comes to a drawdown. And it's really because of yields. You know, we, we talked about yields being really bad. The 10 year can look really, really bad. 10 year can go another, can it can drop, you know, 12% and, and, and send equities into a, a nosedive before it reaches a resistance back in 2006 and 2007, you know, almost 20 years ago, um, when it comes to yield. We've been seeing the IWM really take a pounding along with utilities. These are utilities and IWM, they're really sensitive to rates in the sense that, you know, why be in a utility if you can just get the same rate on a bill or a bond short term and not be exposed to the equity to get that, to get that utilities um, uh, uh, dividend rate, right? And IWM is just because they can't stand these rates. You know, these these businesses are going to go out of business with these rates, and you're going to see a lot of bankruptcies when it comes to um, real estate or, or or the smaller cap names. And it's just that's why you might see strength in, like, let's say in Apple. Maybe you see a nice strength in Apple. We had more of a flat day because cash rich companies can sustain themselves and self fund during high interest rates. Tesla needs cash. That's why it's not doing as bad. Let's say Rivian. If I was to pull up Rivian's chart. You know, what would that look like? Um, there was articles coming out today that Rivian was losing $30,000 a car. And look at this drawdown during the course of the day. We're talking from a high, like almost 5%, right? So you can see the vulnerabilities of companies that don't have access to easy money or don't have a large balance sheet. That's why um, I think one of the under underrated decision-making um, that Elon has, has really... Um, made, you maybe not even overtly made, but keeping cash on the books and not doing what other people have told them to do, do buybacks or just, you know, trying to buoy, buoy the stock. But the reality is that the business needs to stay in business first, first and foremost, invest in the company when others can't. You're talking about Ford who's shutting down work on, on battery plants because they don't know if they can support that battery plant at any profitability or any profitable way or in any competitive way. And then you start to understand that the investments that Tesla can make in this company with a lot of cash on hand, not going into debt, like all the other companies are so in debt in the automotive sector, and Tesla has really no debt to speak of. So anyways, um, well, I want to make it really quick. Um, just know that I'm probably going to clean up the chart, um, but know what, what are we looking at for levels? Um, we I had a higher EM, 265, lower at 235. I would look for opportunities to go short when, when you hit resistances that make sense, which are like $5 increments on stock prices. And... Um, if you make a notable high though, I mean, if you get above 255 in some notable way and you close above 255, I would kind of be kind of happy about that and actually look at 260s as the real resistance level for the stock. If you go, if you gap down tomorrow, where can you go? Let's just, just uh, hypothetical scenario. Let's say you gap down 1% and 1% on Tesla is not a lot. Let's say you're sitting on the pink line, 249, something like that. If you go to the lower AM within one or two days, it's only a 5% move. Just remember we did a 4% move intraday today. So 5% isn't a lot. Think about if you see weakness, you can keep playing on a weakness. You don't have the necessary long weakness because it's quote unquote cheaper. All right. Thanks so much, guys. Have a good night.